Oh, brother, thank you so much for not only setting the atmosphere through the gift of song, but by touching our souls and our spirit through your testimony. Amen. Did she testify through that song on today? Grace and peace to you from God the Father, Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord and Savior, and the sweet, sweet Holy Spirit. I've already read the text in your hearing. It's a long text, so I'm not going to reread it, but I would invite you to keep your fingers on Mark 8 as we walk through it on this particular Sunday as I preach from the subject, how is it with your soul? Family, won't you please pray with me? Oh, good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. And just as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one, help us to be one with your word, one with your wisdom, and one with your very way. Oh, great Jehovah, have your people to know that I am nothing, absolutely nothing apart from you, but indeed you're everything. So please, Lord Jesus, use this, your earthen vessel, as an instrument of your divine love, to proclaim your holy and righteous word so that those who have come into this sanctuary, to those who have opened up a Zoom link, a Facebook link, a YouTube link, or whatever kind of link, who are hurting on today, may experience your healing touch. And those who are captive, would be set free. In the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, let all who love the Lord say, Amen. How is it with your soul? I'm going to ask the question again, but this time I want you to be honest with God and to be honest with yourself as you reflect upon your response. How is it with your soul? Is your soul distressed by the cares and concerns of this world? Is your soul vexed and perplexed by the vicissitudes of a vicarious lifestyle? Is your soul dampened and depressed by the dark realities of your life? How is it with your soul? Is your soul full of joy and jubilation? Is your soul full of hope and happiness? Is your soul full of peace and prosperity? How is it with your soul? Is your soul a barometer of the circumstances of your daily experiences? Is your soul as high as the highest mountain one moment, and then the next moment as low as the lowest valley? Is your soul passionate, prayerful, persistent one day, and passive, pained, and panicked the next day. How is it with your soul? Is your soul caring and compassionate and Christ-centered or is it cruel, cavalier and self-centered? Is your soul loving, learned and likable or is your soul full of lust, lamenting and utterly lost? How is it with your soul? Are you up one moment and down the next moment? How is it with your soul? You know, if we are honest, most of us will admit that our souls experience a, a wide range of emotions from week to week and sometimes even from day to day. So it is my assignment this morning to encourage you to do three things. One is to deny yourself. The second is to take up your cross. 
And the third is to follow Jesus on the road that will lead me, lead you, lead us to holistic health for our soul. How is it with your soul? Some of us are up and some of us are down, but regardless of how you feel right now, why don't you just give yourself a, a great big old hug? I know we used to hug each other at this time, but just give yourself a big old hug and encourage yourself and say, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. We still don't know when COVID will cease. Even so, it, it is well with my soul. Uh, my body, your body might be hurting because of health problems right now. Even so, it is well with my soul. Uh, my heart is heavy because of he family problems. Even so, it, it is well with my soul. My mind is burdened because of financial problems. Even so, it is well with my soul. Whatever, whatever comes my way, as long as who? Jesus is on my side. It is well with my soul. In our text, Jesus is trying to tell the disciples that some bad times are about to come his way. But, but even so, he's trying to also let him know that it is well with my soul. Jesus is trying to tell the disciples about the stark reality of his upcoming death and resurrection. But, but you know, sometimes our close friends and family members, they don't want to hear bad news when we try to bring them bad news. And don't try and tell a close family member or friend that you are about to die. They really don't want to hear that that they can't handle our imminent death even if we are prepared to die. So, so Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Peter gave Jesus a sharp reprimand. Peter must have been confused because just a few moments earlier, he had proclaimed Jesus as the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. God's uh, anointed one. But, but now Jesus uh, is rebuked by Peter. Now, I, I know it's attempting to judge Peter uh, for his actions, but, but in a sense, all of us are guilty of, reparate, of reprimanding Jesus in one way or another. Peter's unwillingness to accept Jesus' prophetic words was perfectly natural in Peter's situation. Jesus' death went against everything he had ever known, everything he had ever been taught. So, so Peter simply refused to believe Jesus was about to be crucified. Centuries of Christian history have made us very familiar with the idea of a suffering Savior, but that would have been foreign to Peter at that time. You know, we've come to a place now where we, at least theoretically, accept the notion of a suffering Savior. Matter of fact, we even sing about it. And yet, uh, often through our attitudes and our very actions, we also rebuke Jesus. To tell the truth, many of us prefer a form of discipleship that actually leaves out the cross. Most Christians prefer a cheerful, moderate, reasonable, sensible religion. Well, we do our best to shut out uh, the necessity of painful sacrifice. I mean, after all, we live in a practical world and, and the cross is such a very impractical thing. But Jesus' way involves suffering. And, and unless we see this clearly, we will miss both the pain and the glory of the cross. Because the pain of the cross and the glory of the cross are inseparably intertwined. Without the pain of the cross, 
Christianity degenerates into petty legalism. If we try to avoid the pain of the cross, we will focus on following rules instead of being present with people who are hurting and showing them sacrificial love. We will focus on learning about love instead of practicing love, period. Jesus spoke plainly about the cost of his ministry and about the cost of discipleship. Question, do we, Sister Vanola, do we really value discipleship? The theologian Carl Henry once said, the transformation of the blood-stained wooden cross of Calvary to the diamond-studded gold cross of a cathedral may well signify humankind's attempt to remove the offense of the cross. Beloved, I, you know, I, I, I love hip hop. But matter of fact, if you were to listen to my, my, my favorite list on Apple, my Paul's favorite list on, on Apple Music, you probably would be utterly shocked. I, I, I love hip hop, even with all the inappropriate lyrics, even with all the erotic dancing, I still love hip hop. So please don't think I, I'm hating on hip hop artists, but, but, but have you ever noticed how many hip hop artists wear huge expensive crosses around their neck? And every time I, I, I see a hip hop artist with, with a huge expensive cross around their neck, I, I can't help but wonder if they know or uh, even really care about the significance of the cross. Jesus spoke plainly about the cost of his ministry and the, the cost of following him, but, but we don't want to know him or to record, reprimand. So we reprimand Jesus because we don't really want to know him and we don't really want to follow him. We rebuke Jesus. So, so Peter reprimands Jesus. P Peter wants Jesus to, to talk more about cheerful and careful things. And, and yet because of this, what does Jesus do? Jesus calls him Satan. The merely cheerful and careful views of Christianity are always a ploy of the enemy. They are always a trick of distraction of the devil. They're always a, a way of Satan trying to, to deter, deter us from the way in which God would have us to go. A, a Christianity that is deluded into just a cheerful and careful religion in which God acts of redemption in Christ have, have been dropped out of the picture is completely a creation of Satan. Satan wants us to choose comfort over character. Satan wants us to choose pride instead of humility. Satan wants us to choose prosperity over a passionate desire to help the least and the left out of our society. Satan wants us to choose a, a concept of Christian discipleship, which is reduced to, to common sense, to, to doing what is reasonable, in, in which there is no room for the foolishness of the cross. But if we do this, it is a satanic triumph. So after Peter rebuked Jesus, Jesus turned and looked at his disciples and he rebuked Peter. He, he said, get behind me. Satan. And Jesus said, you do not have uh, in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Do we have in mind the things of God or, or do we have in mind the things of men? How do we spend our time? How do we spend our money? Well, what, what do we fill our minds with? How common is it for us to rebuke Jesus, or to rebuke Christ by the things we do or by ignoring his claim for uh, undivided allegiance? If we spend more time watching TV than reading God's word, then in fact, we're rebuking Jesus. 
If we give an offering based upon what we have left, instead of bringing the first 10% of that which God has blessed us with into God's storehouse, then, then in fact, we are rebuking Jesus. If you want your soul to be well, you cannot rebuke Jesus. I'm going to share with you what I believe in, you'll find in our text to be three things we should focus on if we want our souls to be well. The first thing is we need uh, to deny ourselves. You need to deny yourself. Jesus insisted that we must deny ourselves. The Bible said Jesus called to the crowd uh, to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The word deny, you know, it, it's, it's not some, you know, unclear word. The deny is not some kind of vague word where you kind of have to try to figure out, well, what did Jesus really mean? It, it, the deny doesn't lack clarity. The denying ourselves means far more than just giving a little some something up. The denial of self means that we cease to make ourselves the object of our lives. Denial of self is making ourselves not an end, but a means in the kingdom of God. Denying ourselves is not just for the sake of denial like some sort of moral Olympics. We're not trying to win the gold, silver, or bronze of morality. But, but we are denying ourselves for Christ's sake. It is for the sake of putting ourselves into alignment with the cause of Christ. And there is nothing more life-giving and life-transforming and life-liberating than following Christ. The, the, the second thing I would lift up in your hearing is to say that if you want it to be well with your soul, you need to take up your cross. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The word cross is, you know, a, 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 another word uh, that we seem to act like we have difficulty in uh, understanding or applying in our lives. It, you, you know, it, it's certainly one in which has been misused uh, throughout the, the Christian vernacular throughout our Christian vocabularies. One of my professors at Wesley Theological Seminary, Dr. Uh, Lawrence Stuckey said, we often speak of calamity as a cross that we must bear, but a calamity is not a cross. It, it might be a tragedy, uh, but a tragedy is not a cross. In other words, we, we lose close loved ones and we'll, we'll say, well, I guess that's just my cross to bear, but in, in reality, it's not. You, you know, we sometimes speak of, of a sor sorrow or a loss as a cross. These things are horrible, heavy burdens, but they are not a cross. Some of us might speak of our own shortcomings. You, you, you've heard people do that, right? You, you know, like, well, you know, I... Uh, you know, I, 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 I know I, 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 I take a little drinking and I guess that's just my cross to bear or I, I, maybe I gossip a little bit. Maybe that's just my cross to bear or I have a little bit of trouble controlling my anger. I guess that's just my cross to bear uh, or I'm a little bit too sensitive or impatient or any number of things. And, and, and we'll say, well, that's just my cross to bear. But, but in fact, that's not a cross to bear. Taking up the cross of Christ does, does not stoically mean enduring what has happened to us. The cross for Jesus was his deliberate choice. Don't, don't miss that. Jesus had a choice, just like we have a choice as in terms of whether or not we will take up our cross. You know, God forbid we, we get cancer or any number of things, but that's not a cross to bear. That's not a choice that we made, right? Taking up the, the, the cross for Jesus is a choice that we, that we made, just like Jesus made that, deliberately, that deliberate choice to take up the cross so that he could give us life. 
The cross was Jesus' deliberate choice to, to minister to our need to know just how much God loves us, no matter what the cost. In, in other words, Jesus was willing to, to die on the cross deliberately, intentionally, just so that we would know and begin to get a glimpse of just how much God loves us. Taking up a cross for a Christian means taking up Christ's cross, not our cross. Uh, I'm going to say it again in case you missed it. Taking up a, a, a cross for a Christian means that we take up uh, the cross of Jesus Christ, not our cross. It is our deliberate choice to, to take up something painful that actually could have been avoided. When we take up our cross and, and follow Jesus the Christ, it means we are willing to suffer. It means we are willing to experience danger. It means we are willing to take on the burdens of other people's lives. It means we are willing to join the struggle against evil, regardless of the cost. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Then the third thing, the third and final thing I will bring to your attention is if you want it to be well with your soul, you need to follow Jesus. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and, and take up his cross and follow me. How can we tell if we are following Jesus? The easiest way we can discern if we are following Christ is to reflect upon our actions and examine whether or not they are in alignment with the actions of Jesus. In other words, each day as you're bringing the day to a, 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 a close, you, you need to ask yourself, the, the words that I spoke, were they kind and compassionate words like Jesus would have shared? Did I speak boldly for justice and come out against evil the way Jesus would have stood up to those who were trying to, to do harm any, any number of ways. Is that which I purpose in my heart each day in, a, in alignment with Jesus? That, what it, that is what it means to, to follow Jesus. Ultimately, do we love like Jesus? Beloved, as I close, I, I want to share a story, a familiar story. Honestly, you probably, some of you probably heard it before, but I'm going to share it again anyway. It's a story about Horatio Spafford. He was a successful attorney and real estate investor who lost a fortune in uh, the great Chicago fire of 1871. Around the same time, his beloved four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. Thinking a vacation would do his family some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on a ship to England, planning to join them after he finished some pressing business that he had to attend to at home. However, while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship was involved in a terrible collision and, and it sunk. More than 200 people lost their lives, including all four of Horatio Spafford's precious daughters. His wife, Anna, survived the tragedy. And when she arrived in England, she, she sent a telegram to her husband that simply said, saved alone, what shall I do? Horatio immediately set sail for England. At one point during his voyage, the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy that had struck the Spafford family, summoned Horatio to tell him that they were now passing over the spot where the shipwreck had occurred. As Horatio uh, thought about his daughters and words of comfort and hope began uh, to fill his heart and, and mind, and, and he wrote them down, and, and they have since become a, a very well-known and beloved hymn of the church. When peace 
like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like a sea billows roll. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well with my soul. That's my prayer for us today, Hughes, that it be well with our souls. God bless you. Amen. Look. Let us.